everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Animal Behavior Meets Social Science. It's a research symposium. We value your time and support. We're very excited because this is really showcasing a partnership between our university, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and the Gladys Porter Zoo. And we also have a partnership with Harlingen CISD. So my job is going to be an easy job because I'm actually going to introduce the individual who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Wendy James Aldridge. Dr. Aldridge is currently the curator of behavioral research at the Gladys Porter Zoo, and she knows our keynote speaker very well. So I think she is the perfect individual to introduce our keynote speaker. And following that introduction, uh, Dr. Birchfield will give his presentation that we're all looking forward to. Just a quick announcement. We do have the mute. Most people will be muted. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask a question. We, we encourage you to use the chat room. You can maybe type a question there. If you really, really would like to speak, and we do have a question and answer session toward the end. So if you'd like to speak, just let us know. We can unmute you. And I believe at the very bottom under reactions, you can raise your hand, for example, and I'll be monitoring the chat. Estela de la Garza, who's from the Office of Engaged Scholarship and Learning, has also graciously and kindly agreed to help us be a moderator as well, so she can help us as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Aldridge to do the introduction. Go ahead, Wendy. Hello, everyone. And if there are any social scientists out there, in addition to our usual friends and neighbors, a special hello to you. We may have some things to say to you a little later on. Um, I was very pleased to discover that Dr. Gill wanted me to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Dr. Patrick Birchfield, but then I thought, what do I choose to tell about no. someone that I have known for 44 years? Um, but we'll keep it simple and we'll start with some facts. Uh, Dr. Birchfield is currently the executive director of the Gladys Porter Zoo. And this is an institution that he has devoted the bulk of his adult life to. But he'd already done some pretty interesting things before he got here. He developed an interest in herpetology when he was quite young. Herpetology means that he had an interest in things like snakes and frogs and turtles, and I'm sure his parents enjoyed that, uh, though now that I think about it, I don't know that he ever mentioned how his interests were received at home, I suspect pretty positively. Uh, he began volunteering in the reptile department of the Columbus Zoo during his senior year in high school. Columbus, Ohio, by the way, is his hometown. And soon after that, he was hired as a keeper. He carried his interest in herpetology a bit further, however, when he enlisted in the U.S. Army and worked in the Army Medical Research Laboratory at Fort Knox, Kentucky, where he was in charge of their snake venom production lab for four years. That means he was in charge of extracting and providing snake venom that was then used in biomedical and pathology studies. And to do that, he collected snakes in Southeast Asia and all through tropical America. And even though I know that about him, I still like him anyway. Uh, he came to us here to Brownsville in 1970, where he was offered the position of reptile supervisor at the brand new, but not yet open to the public, Gladys Porter Zoo. As the zoo was opening, however, the next year in 1971, he was promoted to general curator in charge of the animal collection. And during the decades that followed, he became deputy director and zoologist and as of January 1st, 2007, he's overseen the zoo in the capacity of executive director. But interspersed among all these bits of key life events and landmarks, there have been others that reveal a great deal about the man who is the executive director. One of those events was an almost accidental introduction to his decades long work on the conservation of the critically endangered Camp's Ridley sea turtle. He was actually collecting snakes in Tamaulipas, Mexico, when he was introduced to some people doing turtle research. It was a project that captured his imagination and his heart 
and it has been part of his life alongside all of his zoo responsibilities since 1973. And if you've not heard the story of Pat Birchfield and the Camps Ridley Sea Turtles, you need to hear that one. Another thing that is important to know about Dr. Birchfield is that he understands the importance of an educated approach to the operation of a zoo and the care provided to its animals. That's best exemplified by the fact that he obtained all of his degrees, both undergraduate and advanced, after he began his work at the Gladys Porter Zoo. Working and going to school at the same time are not easy. Many of you out there are well aware of that. But his commitment to the importance of education has had a significant impact on the direction of the zoo's evolution. His belief in the importance of education is also exemplified in his willingness to serve as a UTRGV instructor. He offers his expertise in teaching courses like herpetology, mammalogy, ecology, and my favorite, zoo biology. On a very personal level, it also means that he's always been a warm supporter of my own work beginning a long time ago. Research that I conducted on the grounds of the zoo, but in my capacity at the time as a new psychology professor at one of UTRGV's long ago legacy institutions, Pan American University. Yes, even before UT Pan American. And for that support and the friendship that accompanied it, I will be forever grateful. And now I present to you the recipient of, and these are just a few of many possibilities, the 2005 U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Gulf Guardian Award, the 2007 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Recovery Champion Award, and the 2020 President's Choice Award for a lifetime of achievement in sea turtle conservation. This is Patrick Birchfield, my friend and the executive director of the Gladys Porter Zoo. It's yours, Pat. As Dr. Aldridge uh, Uh, primarily to build a reptile collection. But going back to prior to that time at the Columbus, Ohio Zoo, where I began as a volunteer in 1959 and, and 60, and actually went on the payroll in 1961, uh, I'm in a unique position to talk about the history of zoos because I've seen a big part of the evolution of zoos because the evolution of zoos really didn't do much until actually uh, about uh, the 1960s following the publishing of uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and what amounted to the birth of the ecological uh, evolution or revolution, you might have called it at that time. But, you know, speaking from an historic standpoint, man has kept animals in human care or in the earlier days, perhaps in human custody would have been a better term, uh, going back more than 4,500, perhaps 5,000 years in, in Egypt. Uh, Queen Hatshepsut actually had an African collection around 1508 BC. Uh, and in the 12th century in China, Emperor Wen Wang actually had a menagerie that was called the Garden of Intelligence. And this is a really important phrase because even in that early time, that Chinese emperor felt that there was something to be learned by being in the presence of these wonderful, beautiful animals. 
So that's the first reference we hear of a menagerie being used as a tool for education. And in 1780, the Louis XIV had created a, a menagerie among uh, the very elegant palace at Versailles, which uh, actually he wasn't the first one to keep animals there, but because animals had always been a sign of power for monarchs and aristocrats, a, a sign of power and wealth and dominance over every, everyone and everything. And um, when he lost his head, <laughs> actually uh, in 1789, the animals at the Palace of Versailles were moved to a newly evolving natural history park in Paris. But again, the early beginnings of zoos, with the exception of perhaps Wen Wang in China, were basically menageries of animals uh, brought from different parts of the world as a demonstration of wealth and power. And that really didn't change much. And that wasn't unique to Europe and Asia. Uh, in 1519, when Hernan Cortes came to Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, Montezuma had a massive menagerie of animals, great and small, so massive that it required 300 people to take care of it. He had 300 keepers in 1519. So the history of, of humankind uh, either incarcerating or exhibiting animals uh, goes back over 5,000 years BC and continued up until about the 1960s. And until the 1960s, I would have to say that zoos basically were menageries and a zoo was gauged and judged by the number of species and the number of specimens could be crammed within the boundary fences of the zoo, par zoo or park where it was born. Early examples of zoos in the United States, uh, the Philadelphia Zoo lays claim to being the first zoo in the US, but actually there were several menageries that predated that. And I'll just give you a list of some of them. Uh, Binghamton uh, Zoo in Ross Park in uh, Baltimore, 1875. Buffalo Zoo, 1875. Cincinnati Zoo, 1875. Uh, Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, 1868. And Central Park Zoo, 1874. But Philadelphia was the first city to form a zoological society, so they lay claim to being the oldest zoo in the country, even though menageries were kept in several other, Portland, Oregon as well, in several other major cities. But again, these were assemblages of animals that were brought from all over the world, but in the early days, in the 1960s and before, animals tend to be grouped in displays like, for example, the reptile house, the bird house, the carnivora exhibit or carnivora building, the monkey house. They were grouped taxonomically. Uh, they were kept in discrete buildings and generally small barred cages and small enclosures. And again, it wasn't until the 1960s and Rachel Carson, that people started being concerned about the environment and those organisms that, that made up the environment and their well being, et cetera, which kind of caused an evolutionary change in zoos, which, having been working in zoos now for 62 years, actually, uh, I've gotten to see most of that evolutionary process. And it's been fun and interesting all the way. But I've seen such a great change in philosophy and uh, technology among, among zoos and zookeepers. For example, when I began working in the zoo profession, the only requisite in my case was that I wasn't afraid of snakes. I didn't have to have a college education. I didn't have to have a degree. And most of my colleagues working at the Columbus Zoo were either farmers or ranchers or agrarian people of some some kind that had experience working with cattle, sheep, goats, horses, et cetera, who knew around how to work around big animals. So going back in, to the 1960s, the technology and the, the science were pretty much non-existent. And that started to change. That all started to change basically 
partially because of Rachel Carson and a more educated zoo visitor that expected more out of zoos and expected to see better care for animals and better exhibits or better habitats. Uh, it all started to change basically with the uh, first captive birth of a gorilla at the Columbus, Ohio Zoo. And that kind of fits into our story. Colo was born at the Columbus Zoo in 1956. Fortunately, I got to take care of her when she was four and five years old. So I, I remember taking care of the first captive born gorilla in captivity. And at that time, gorillas were basically pulled off of their mothers, sometimes living or sometimes lawn living in order to get the babies. But the science wasn't there. And most baby gorillas that were brought into human care or, or captivity at that time were raised by humans and basically became uh, human uh, mimics uh, because they, they had not been exposed to wild gorillas or wild gorilla sociology. But anyway, to make a long story short, how that fits into our story at the Gladys Porter Zoo, the man that removed the muconium from the baby gorilla in the Columbus Zoo, which was not moving and not breathing, was Dr. Warren Dean Thomas, who was our first zoo director here at the Gladys Porter Zoo. From that event, the birthing of Colo, he went straight from graduating from veterinary school to becoming director of the Oklahoma City Zoo. His picture was on Time Magazine. It was the biggest event in biology, zoology uh, in 1956. It made the cover of Time Magazine. And the zoo profession started to evolve from that point, really. And in those days, in the 1960s, along with Dr. Thomas, a whole cadre of veterinarians from Columbus, Ohio, and St. Louis became zoo directors around the country. Because part and parcel with this evolution of science and technology in zoos and the public demanding more than just having an animal with a label, uh, a lot of small and medium-sized zoos employed a veterinarian to be able to give better care, better veterinary care, uh, better nutritional advice, and do a better job with taking care of the animals, which started a whole kind of evolutionary educational process with zookeeping and zookeepers. So a big part of that started with zoo veterinarians becoming zoo directors. And that persisted up until the 80s. And I have to explain this uh, a little bit. Zoos, depending on their size, uh, well, they're all complex because not only do you have the animals, the plants, the animal diets, the zoo visitors, they're, they're a whole bunch of different moving parts and plus the economics of running zoos. Zoos are very, very expensive to operate because uh, from a, a, an accreditation standpoint, from a national organizational standpoint, we only feed top grade food products to our animal collection. The same things you buy at HEB or, or uh, Kroger's or whatever food store is in your area, we have to provide first quality food for all of our animals. There's no picking up day old produce or anything of that. They all get top rate stuff. And nowadays, nowadays there are actually manufactured diets for a lot of things like you can buy a flamingo diet that's already been formulated. There are nutritionists working on it. They've developed it. They keep tweaking it. They improve it. You can buy monkey chow, which are a pelleted or a biscuit type food. Old world monkey chow, new world monkey chow, lemur uh, chow. All these diets have been worked on and improved. But along with in improving technology and the science of animal husbandry, if you will, looking at, at ecosystems, uh, we realized early on that a lot of species were very, very imperiled in the wild. And going back as far as 1950s, Gerald Durrell in 1959 opened the Jersey Zoo and Gerald Durrell stated on multiple occasions and in many different forums 
that zoos needed to be arcs and to start to assemble groups, breeding groups of animals that were critically endangered in the wild of becoming extinct. And he started that with his Jersey Animal Trust in, uh, on the Isle of Jersey. And that kind of put out a message to the zoo community. That was 1959. And so he was kind of the, the originator of that concept, but when Dr. Warren Thomas, our original zoo director, met with Gladys Sams Porter sometime in 1968, uh, a full, full three years before the zoo opened, they came up with the concept of building a zoo specifically for putting together breeding groups of critically endangered animals at a time this was three years before the United States passed the Endangered Species Act. So this was pretty forward thinking stuff. And that was the first time that I think a lot of people really started to realize how critically endangered some animals were and it was already too late for some or that a zoo could even participate in the process of perhaps perpetuating them into the future generations. Nowadays, any endangered species in a, an AZA or Association of, Association of Zoo and Aquarium Zoo, uh, any organization in that AZA group of accredited zoos have what and participate in species survival plans. And what those amount to is genetically managing the groups of animals in our collections to try and maintain maximum genetic diversity for the next hundred years, or at least better than 98% genetic diversity, which means that that animal population is base basically secure in human care. That doesn't assure what's going to happen in the wild. And that's why we do this. And historically, from an historic point of view, if you would ask me when we began the zoo, I would tell you that's our number one mission was to put together these breeding groups of critically endangered animals. And we've done a pretty good job of it with a lot of species, not so good with a few others. But at large, zoos have done a good job at that. For example, we would not have to bring any Western lowland gorillas out of the wild for the next hundred years. We have that population genetically diverse enough to, to stay as it is without bringing in a single animal from the wild. And that's our goal, goal with a lot of these. Uh, species, but in some cases, like in the case of the California condor, when you were down to five wild animals with 24 or 26 in zoos, uh, finally the people that were anti-zoo or anti-bringing them into human care said, we're either going to do that or we're going to lose them entirely. So now we've got a different problem. You have a Pleistocene vulture, this giant vulture, which we have bred a lot of in zoos now, but their food source is gone. When bison roamed the Great Plains in tens of thousands, if not millions, there was a lot of carrion out there. And this is a carrion, primarily carrion eating animal or predominantly carrion eating animal. So now we have perpetuated a species which maybe naturally was becoming extinct because its food source was gone. So it's an even more complex process, putting, putting them back in the wild and having them reproduce and survive. But there have been other success stories, things like the golden lion tamarin, the Arabian oryx was functionally extinct in the African continent until it was put back, put back from production primarily in US and European zoos. It was extinct in the wild, gone, completely gone. And we can do that with many, many hooved animal species, a lot of different ungulates. There's still a lot of them in human care and things like uh, the adax, things like the scimitar oryx are functionally basically going extinct in the wild. Why? Because of competition for habitat, for primarily agriculture in, in uh, developing countries. And that's the biggest problem. But going back to one of the premises I was going to try and make, if you had asked me in the 1960s, what's the most important mission for a zoo, I would have said putting together breeding groups of critically endangered species. You ask me that question now, I'll tell you, bringing nature, getting children outdoors, educating the next generation 
as to how all of these things interrelate and work. This, this generation that's just coming up now is predicted to be the first generation in recent history that perhaps won't live as long as their parent generation because we're raising them in a bubble. They don't get out and eat mud, play in the dirt. Uh, they don't explore, they don't go outside. So the role of zoos, as opposed to just strictly conservation, to me, the number one role of any modern zoo is education and getting children involved in outside activities, whether it's going to the zoo or learning how to germinate plants, planting native plants in your yard to help create backyard habitats. Uh, the young population is definitely suffering from nature deficit disorder, without a doubt. And so there, and, uh, there again is another important thing uh, with zoos. I can show you a picture of a gorilla. You can watch Discovery's channel and see a crocodile grab a, a zebra or all of those types of things. But when you come to the zoo and you look in the eyes of the gorilla, it looks back, you take a deep breath, you smell gorilla. That's an entirely different experience. And that's one that you will not forget. And people do not protect or care about things that they aren't familiar with. So zoos basically have become the eyes to nature for virtually every urban child in the United States, Baltimore, Washington, uh, Detroit, Chicago, all these big cities. Those children's only exposure to nature is concrete asphalt and belching smokestacks. But if they can go to that refugia that the zoo creates and just relate to one animal, what a gain, what, a, what an experience. I remember as a small child going to Orton Hall at Ohio State University and looking at the giant dinosaur skeleton, uh, the T-Rex skeleton and being standing there and having to be dragged away by my parents or going to the Ohio State Museum and seeing a live snake and I stood transfixed. But we do more that, than that in, in zoos today. We actually have education classes, camps. Uh, kids get a chance to physically come in contact with animals, to learn about animals. One of our programs, students teaching students, the students develop the script and do the presentations for the public. And we teach them how to do public speaking. Now that's a life skill. That's not just learning about animals. They create the lesson plan, they create their presentation and they get up in front of the zoo public and give presentations. And that is so powerful because while they're developing those lesson plans and learning about the animals, I'd hate to tell you how many of our summer teens are now zoo employees or they're biologists or they're working in some related field. It, you have to have that direct contact with something living in order to appreciate it. But that's why zoos have become so important. The, the roles of a modern zoo basically are education, conservation, research, and wholesome family outdoor recreation. Most people don't go to the zoo to be educated. It's up to us to trick them into learning or to make their experience so impactful that they want to learn. For example, the child that gets to feed flamingos out of their hand or marvel at handing a 200 year old or 100 year old Galapagos tortoise a piece of cactus pad. Those are life experiences and life changing. And I know that first person because the first time I ever found a baby Ridley turtle behind a sand dune out of Mexico and carried it across the sand dune and turned it loose at the edge of the water, I've been there 40 years now. I mean, these are life changing things. But in order to get children out of doors, away from the computer screen, you have to have these outdoor educational venues and it's contingent upon us to make them as experiential and as educational as possible. And that's what zoos have become. They become the windows or the eyes 
to nature for the vast majority of urban America. And if I go back just 60 years, all of those people I worked with at the Columbus, Ohio Zoo were farmers, all of them. Now we're an urban population with a few people raising all our food and heaven forbid anything happens to them or we're all in big trouble. But uh, anyway, along with the evolution in theories of keeping animals, as I started in the beginning, zoos were consumers of animals. And going back in the 50s and 60s and before that, no one saw that there was any need to learn about them or, or, or study them. You just replace them if they passed on. You got another one. So zoos were consumers of animals in those days, no doubt about it. But I would tell you that our patriarch and matriarch of our gorilla group, which would have fallen in that category, uh, were taken out of the wild at five and six years of age deliberately so they could impart their natural behaviors on offspring that they would produce. So they had actually lived in a normal, well-socialized gorilla group and perhaps those behaviors could be imparted on their offspring because at that point in time, all the baby gorillas in captivity had been, had been raised by humans. And for a long time, we thought, and Wendy, correct me if I'm wrong, for a long time, we thought that all of the behaviors involved with birthing and breeding and all those things were learned, observed behaviors. But because through an, through an accidental process, we ended up having to hand raise all of Katanga's babies, three of them, three of her first four babies were very good mothers. And the fourth one, not so much. She just put the baby down or sit a rock on it or whatever. So we ended up hand raising all of Katanga's babies. But three of her babies were very good mothers, which had been raised by human humans and one of them wasn't a good mother. So that's hardwired, that behavior of taking care of the young and knowing how to take care of the young, which up until recently, we didn't know that. We thought it was all learned, observed behavior. And case in point, that's why you need to have animals up close and personal because not every researcher, not every biologist can go to Africa or Asia to study these animals. And if we're gonna protect them in situ, in the wild, we have to know about their basic biology and basic behaviors. So animals in human care can be very valuable to the wild populations. Another example of that is when you see the game rangers in Ambicelli Park or some other big game park, Kruger National Park darting an animal, those game park rangers didn't come up with the veterinary techniques to dart that animal. That came from zoo veterinarians. And we learned the hard way by trial and error, which drugs to use with which animals, for example, if you want to knock down an antelope, carfentanil is the drug of choice because they go down very quickly, within about a minute and a half. Whereas other drugs, when you're dealing with a hoofed mammal, you don't want them staggering around in a confused state and banging into things and injuring themselves. So carfentanil is the drug of choice. But we didn't know it until a couple Australian veterinarians had a syringe blow up in their face and they died instantly because carfentanil is very toxic to all primates. So when we use that opioid, we have the reversal right with us at the time in case of an accident. And carfentanil is very good with all hooved animals except for Barasinga deer. And there's one other ex exception, I think uh, Father Armand David deer, which is lethal to. But no one would have ever known that were it not for research by zoo veterinarians. But that's what the field biologists use when they go to tranquilize an animal, to put a radio collar on it, to, to put a, some other sort of monitor device on it, draw blood, check its condition. So a lot of field biology techniques come directly from zoo veterinarians who have done the research. Right now, we're working with a, a very strange group of animals, and we don't even exhibit them. We're working with pangolins. And previously, people said you can't keep pangolins in captivity. Well, it's like anything else, unless you're willing to take the time, the effort, and the resources to figure out how to keep them in captivity. And that's not the ultimate goal, but all pangolins are now listed as endangered species. And we want to learn something about the least endangered pangolins 
uh, even before they were listed so that we could be helpful if they do have to be reproduced in the future, we'd know how to do it. And we're in our fifth year of pangolins, which all the experts said you couldn't keep. African pangolins, Asian pangolins are a little easier and they've been kept successfully over long periods of time. There's eight species of pangolins, four in Africa and four in Asia, but the Asian species are fairly long lived and easy to maintain. But like anything else, uh, if you devote the time and the effort and the study, you'll figure it out and you'll find the keys to keeping it healthy and happy. Nowadays, uh, most zoos, when they build exhibits, are building habitats that are designed specifically for that species and perhaps other species. But when zoos went away from the barred cages to natural habitat displays, that wasn't a new concept. Uh, actually, the Hagenbach Zoo in, uh, in Europe, Carl Hagenbach Jr. and, a, and a, a, an engineer named Ernest Eggschweiler developed the bar, first barless cageless zoo in 1907 in Hagenbach, Germany, or Stuttgart. But to make a long story short, that concept didn't come to the US until the early 1900s when we saw the first attempts at kind of a habitat zoo would have probably been uh, large moated exhibits for lions or bears, but everything else in the zoo was still kept in a barred small square caged unit. But basically when we built Gladys Porter Zoo in 1968 through 71, Warren Thomas and Gladys Porter had come up with the idea that they were going to emulate Hagenbach's design and have a barless cageless zoo and create all natural habitats. And we had, the, we had the advantage of having a blank piece of ground. We didn't have a bunch of old barred cages that would have to be torn down or replaced, which is extremely costly. And that's why it's taken a lot of zoos so long to, to renovate or replace those, those particular types of exhibits. But, uh, if not the first, we were one of the very first barless cageless zoos in the United States. And the only zoo that I know was specifically built to house critically endangered and very rare animals that were disappearing in the wild. And again, that's not to say that other zoos didn't have uh, endangered species prior to that, but we were built specifically for that purpose. And we've done a pretty good job. And uh, I think I'm a, I've about run my course. And uh, later, if someone has questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. But uh, it's, it's been an interesting, interesting trip. Let me, let me add one thing. Uh, when, when it came to natural habitat zoos, one of the first really, really good natural ex habitat exhibits was at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum in Tucson. And it was built by a man named Merv Larson, who went on to found a company called Larson Creations, who did the Congo exhibit at the Bronx Zoo and a lot of other wonderful, very naturalistic habitat type displays. Uh, he was at the top or the apex of the group of zoo exhibit designers and builders. And then another fortunate thing happened, Dr. Lee Simmons, who also started out at the Columbus, Ohio Zoo, I worked with him at Columbus as well, when he was in Omaha, created the Lide Jungle and also the Desert Dome, fabulous natural habitat exhibits. And so since that time, since, since the 70s, zoos have evolved dramatically from an exhibit point of view. And uh, again, now our biggest trick is figuring out how to get all the people that come to the zoo to learn something out of that experience and create stewards out of those folks. And this may come as a shock to you other educators, but uh, in the 1970s, Dale Mar Dr. Dale Marcellini at the Smithsonian, this is 1970s, did a survey on how many people read a label at a zoo or any label in a museum, 3%, 3%. That's going back to the 1970s and people read less now than they did back then. So I don't know what that number would be if, if you were to do that same survey. 
And as I was walking through the birdhouse with Dale, he said, I'm going to teach you something. I said, I'm always opening to, open to learning anything. And he said, you want to see what the most popular label and the most red label in the birdhouse is? And I said, sure. And we stepped around a corner and there's a crowd of people around this one label. And it had a picture of Colonel Harlan Sanders in red and white stripes, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Everybody had to see what that label was about. And it was about the red jungle fowl, the progenitor of all types of chickens. But that taught me a lesson. Humans are interested in what humans are doing. So if you're going to do a graphic, you need to try and put a human doing something because somebody might read that graphic. They want to see what that person's doing. But it's, I just had a conversation yesterday, as recently as yesterday, about talking, uh, talking about putting bulleted factoids out on the zoo grounds to reinforce our, our labels, our graphics, just factoids. But if we can get you to learn 12 factoids before you get out of here, and perhaps the last two or three relate to conservation and ecology, we will have done something. But again, uh, going back to our program, students teaching students, one of the most powerful things that I can recall in my whole zoo life here is the fact that Sergio Garcia, our education curator, took a young autistic gentleman who would not even look you in the eye. And today he has a microphone and he's presenting to groups of zoo visitors in the amphitheater. And he'll tell you more than you ever want to know about most of those animals. Just wonderful. But again, Zoos, there are so many opportunities for education, so many opportunities for getting children out of doors, so many opportunities for, for working with this most important generation, and that's the one that's coming up right now. And thanks for listening to me. And uh, as I said, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Birchfield, for sharing the history of the Gladys Porter Zoo really providing a wonderful presentation. This is a great keynote. And now we're gonna to transition to the question and answer phase. So we've asked people to uh, post their questions in the chat if you'd like, and then I can read the questions. However, we'd also encourage you to raise your hand. So if you look at the very bottom, there's a reaction reactions option or emoji. If you click on raise your hand, if you wanna speak, we can unmute you and then you can ask your question. So we'll get started with Mr. Uh, Glover, Houston Glover. So we're gonna go ahead and unmute you. So you can ask your question, okay? It might ask you to unmute or accept the unmute. So please do that at, at your end, okay? Thank you, Dr. Birchfield for a great talk. Um, I had a question regarding, since you're so interested in, and you're such a good proponent of zoo education, uh, I was an education volunteer at the Houston Zoo for uh, seven years in high school and undergrad and uh, so I was, and, and, and I found that the, one of the best tools for drawing people in to have a conversation with you was having a biofact, something with you sure. that they were interested in. Um, but a couple of years into my time at the Houston Zoo, uh, the education department eliminated biofacts like skulls and, and feathers and, and furs and things, uh, deeming it sort of a, a negative image to be holding a skull of an animal or a piece of a of a deceased animal. I wondered if you had any opinions on maybe the changing views on, on using biofacts in a zoo. Well, again, I think I have no problem with using those biofacts as long as you explain the origin of, of, of the piece. And uh, it, has, it has a function in what you're trying to teach. I, I think sometimes people can get carried, carried away in the wrong direction. Uh, we all are finite. We all have a lifespan and, not, and some of us shorter than others. And if you can continue to utilize and teach with that particular uh, item, be it a skull, a claw, or, or a, a study skin, I, I don't have a problem with it. But uh, again, that's, that's subject to individual interpretation. But uh, lacking, 
letting the children pet a live tiger, which we're not going to do. If, if there, there was a, a, a piece of tiger skin there or something, I would have no problem with, with using that. But, but again, the whole thing is, as you said, evolving. Uh, we hear more and more about animal welfare in zoo. And the thing I would, I would point out to you is that in any zoo, anywhere you go, you will not find a more dedicated group of people than the zookeepers or care more about animals than zookeepers. And some of those people that are, are uh, anti-zoo, I would, I would challenge their level of devotion and dedication as compared to the people they might be criticizing. Uh, because I can't think of a more underpaid, underappreciated group of people in the world, except by the general public. There, you're always going to find people that uh, will find, gravitate toward the, the negative side of any issue. And it's how, how, where do you find the positives? Where do you find the middle ground? How do you make it work? Uh, so, so again, uh, I personally don't have a problem with those bio facts, unless it's something really egregious, but, uh, and obvious that you wouldn't want to put out there. But uh, I use, uh, or I used uh, uh, both bone clone and real crania in, in all my mammalogy classes, which I taught at the zoo for years, and my herpetology classes. And we had preserved specimens. Well, they're dead. We preserve them and we're still using them. They're still benefiting people. So. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, and as you say, bone clones. Um, I just wanted to say one final thing before I unmute my mute myself again. Um, my time as an educator in a zoo is what inspired me to pursue a career uh, in, in science and science education. And it was an interaction with a zoo guest uh, while I was holding a bone clone bear cranium, talking to this child about the differentiation between the teeth and everything, looking at this bear skull that was that click moment. So I owe zoos uh, my entire inspiration and, and, my, and my perpetual career. So thank you. Well, thank you and congratulations. You joined the club. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so we'll, next we'll go with Marie Irwin. I know she had a question in the chat, so we'll go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, Dr. Pat, I just wanted to ask, is the zoo doing something special for Birchfield's second birthday today? If, if we are, they didn't tell me. <laughs> I'm the last one to find out, no. Thank you. And another question in the chat was, what animals have been the hardest to breed at Gladys Porter Zoo? That's coming from the chat. Uh, well, you know, with every program, let me begin my, my response to that by saying the idea of a barless cage lazoo is wonderful and natural habitats with multiple species free roaming is wonderful, but in some cases not realistic. And we found out it, with a, an animal called the Hyrola or hunter's antelope that you can't even keep a pair of them in a zoo sized enclosure. They're very aggressive and they have to have wide open spaces uh, in order to stay away from each other when they're not in a breeding condition. So that species of animal uh, needs to have uh, large expanses of land in order to be successful. So I would say Hyrola or hunter's antelope. We had them for years and we bred them for years, but they never thrived because we didn't have uh, large enough areas to properly maintain them. And I'll just say it that brutally. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Birchfield. Next question is from uh, Marianella Franklin. So we'll go ahead and unmute you, Marianella, if you can ask your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, and thank you, Dr. Birchfield. Uh, very informative. I have a question for you regarding all those uh, wonderful animal lovers here in the Rio Grande Valley 
who sometimes take it upon themselves to bring exotic animals to their own properties. Um, what recommendation do you have for them? And when these animals do get to a point of becoming ill and, and they're unprepared um, because they don't have your background, <laughs> Uh, is there any kind of assistance that the zoo can provide them? Um, because obviously they, they're bringing in exotic animals that our veterinarians may not be familiar with here locally. Um, and I'm just curious what kind of advice you have uh, for those who may consider bringing exotic animals to their properties. First and foremost, don't do it. I know, I know, I, I wish I could okay, have but this person. That not being realistic because some people are going to do it regardless. Uh, people need to educate themselves on what they're getting into. Uh, a lot of exotic animal purchases or, or bringing them in are impulse buying and they have no idea like the person that buys a big beautiful macaw at the pet shop and then gets it home and the first time it screams the neighbors uh, demand that they move out, it all instantly becomes a problem or the macaw eats the couch or whatever and, uh, or the baby tiger that they bought uh, eats the neighbor's dog or becomes big enough that it's going to hurt you. Uh, a lot of exotic animal purchases are impulse buys. Uh, some others are more, more measured or calculated. You know that here in Texas, uh, we have a large number of uh, hunters and fishermen, and we have a lot of exotic game hunting on ranches. And where I don't hunt myself personally, I really don't. I haven't since I was 14. And I shot one thing and it broke my heart and I never did it again. But uh, I, I want to point out to you that were it not for those large herds that people are, are propagating for fun and profit on their ranches, mostly profit, uh, Adax and Scimitar Oryx would be gone, but there are so many in Texas right now uh, that if there was a need to put herds back into the wild, we could call on those folks. And I'm sure that they would participate in helping us to get the animals we'd need to reestablish colonies in the wild. So even though I don't hunt and I don't, I'm not, crazy about the idea. Uh, there's, there's different levels of ex owning exotic animals. There are those people that do it as a business in terms of primarily the hunting industry here in Texas. And then there's those individuals that buy it as a pet animal. And that's just generally a bad idea uh, because most exotic animals are difficult to maintain. There are some that are produced within the pet industry itself uh, I will tell you that when I was uh, 15 and 16 years old and had venomous snakes in my parents' home in Columbus, Ohio, there were only four of us in the state of Ohio that had venomous snakes, and we knew one another. Now they fill amphitheaters with reptile enthusiasts who buy pretty much factory-produced reptiles and amphibians. There's a company, a couple companies that produce tens of thousands of king snakes a year, tens of thousands of rat snakes tens of thousands of ball pythons. And to me, uh, to me, I don't have a problem with people having those pet reptiles as long as they don't turn them loose because at least they're, they're developing an interest in something living and it's a short jump to get many of those people interested in preserving the wild animals in the wild. At least they've already demonstrated an interest in animals to begin with. So basically, exotic animals, and by that I mean taken out of the wild that are, are, uh, are typically uh, captured in the wild, it's a bad idea. It's, it's a very bad idea. And primates are, are a bad idea because they carry all the same diseases that humans do. Uh, a lot of zoonotic diseases can go back and forth between humans and primates. And generally speaking, people buy a pet monkey and then a week later they want to donate it to the zoo. Well, unfortunately, the zoo doesn't have any place to put that pet monkey because we control our collections very carefully and with breeding recommendations in most cases, and we have finite spaces. But we always are there to try and assist people, particularly for the sake of the animal, to find that animal uh, a good home and rehome it somewhere. And just so you'll know, Gladys Porter Zoo is the largest 
and only licensed wildlife rehabilitator here in South Texas. And we, we, we receive over 600 native animals every year. This year is gonna be a lot more because in the past uh, three or four days, we've probably gotten a hundred opossums. <laughs> just, just in the last three or four days. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mariana, for your question. Thank you, Dr. Birchfield. So we we have a few minutes left, um, and I'd like to call on another attendee who has a question, and then try to maybe ask a question from the chat. Uh, we're running out of time, but let's see if we can uh, accomplish two questions. So, Leonela, I'll go ahead and unmute you if you can ask your question. Leonela Juarez. Um. Uh, my question was, um, are the animals that are bred in the zoo, are they released to the wild or are they kept at the zoo? No, most of the most of the animals in zoo programs belong to those species survival plans and offspring are genetically managed and interchanged between zoos primarily in order to to maintain the maximum genetic diversity for that species. But there have been instances when, when zoo animals are released the wild. I gave you the example of the Arabian oryx. And in the early 1970s, we collected some very rare and critically endangered little aquatic box turtles from Coahuila, Mexico. And the very following year, we released 21 babies back to the wild. So it depends on the species. It depends on, on the spatial requirements, but most zoo animals, uh, are interchanged between zoos to maintain genetic groups, but there are reintroduction programs for several of them, like black-footed ferrets, like uh, uh, golden lion tamarins, like Arabian oryx, uh, Guam kingfishers, et cetera, et cetera. So some are put back to the wild, but that goes back to my premise that the, probably the biggest mission or the most important thing for zoos is uh, in the education field. Thank you, Dr. Birchfield. So now onto the chat. Looks like we will be able to ask a few more questions. Actually, somebody, Drea Santillan is asking, they're saying this is a little off, off topic, although I don't, I don't think so. I think it's an interesting question. Let's see. And the question is, is Haram, Harambe was held? They heard that Harambe was held at the Gladys Porter Zoo for a while. Is this true? And I also get this question sometimes. Yeah, go ahead. It was born and raised here. It was born and raised here, and it, it moved to Cincinnati as part of a breeding loan recommendation. And just speaking in terms of gorilladom, uh, generally speaking, and, and Dr. Aldrich can correct me after the fact, uh, generally it's the female gorillas that are moved out of the group once they hit sexual maturity. And the males are allowed to stay longer and up and until the point they start to challenge the silverback. Uh, so the blackbacks, you'll have a silverback or a couple silverbacks and several, a couple blackbacks or several blackbacks up until they start challenging the silverback. It's kind of like humans, fathers and, and teenage sons, when they reach a certain point, you move them out of the house. Okay, thanks, Dr. Birchfield. And we're running out of time. We have two minutes, but I really like this question. I think we'll end with this question, which is a great question from Juan Martinez. Um, first off, he said, Dr. Birchfield, you spoke of your upcoming generation being active. My 12-year-old son has been an animal lover and has been considering a career with animal caring. My question is, is there a prerequisite to volunteer at the zoo? There's not a prerequisite. And we have summer team programs and all sorts of programs through our education department. And if you contact uh, 956-WILD, or no, 546-WILD and talk to the department, they can key you in on all of those different programs. Great. Well, I think we are, actually we made it. It's, it's just a minute till 3 p.m. So I think we'll go ahead and end it now. Um, so a round of applause for our speaker, doc, Dr. Birchfield. Thank you very much for your time, for sharing all of this information and wisdom. It's just everybody in the chat is just very appreciative of, of the information you've provided. So we'd like to give you a, a warm applause and, and appreciate everything that you've, you've done for, for the community here in the Rio Grande Valley. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Excellent. And just a quick announcement, folks, um, you should have received an email from Eventbrite 
letting you know that we have other sessions. So we're gonna end this session in just a second. So I encourage you to log in and try to connect to the other sessions if you're interested. We have student presentations, we have a faculty panel, and then we have a reflection session that's targeted towards students. So thanks again, Dr. Birchfield. Thank you all for your time for connecting. And thanks to the Office of Engaged Scholarship and Learning for your support. All right, bye everyone. Bye-bye.